Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're, they're a hard act to follow. But, you know, let, let me say um, first and foremost, uh, just to continue with a little bit about what Ron has shared with, with, with the audience, is that beyond the broad responsibility of supporting management for the success of the company on behalf of shareholders, the number one responsibility of the board is to pick the chief executive officer. And as you know, if you read, and I know you do, the trade press, CEOs come and go. Uh, and particularly when there is not positive performance. And the board's responsibility oftentimes is to make the tough decision to usher a CEO out uh, because they are not performing. And then you have to go through the process of deciding who should the next institutional leader be? Uh, what does this particular company need at this moment in time, given the broader marketplace, given its competitors? What can we do to ensure that the performance that shareholders expect is actually achieved? Now, you're right, Rusty. Sometimes the issues are incredibly difficult. The very first board I got on within 90 days of uh, joining that board, uh, we had an activist come in and buy our stock and, and try to take control of the company. So when you're sitting on a board, one of the most dramatic things that can happen is when someone or a group of individuals or another company beyond the plan that you have is trying to wrest control from the board and management for their own interest. That takes a considerable amount of knowledge about strategy uh, in terms of how you work through that exercise. Uh, it takes a lot of time beyond the four quarterly meetings that you would go to and the committee meetings in this particular- I, I, I wanna stop you there. How much more time? Because that's when I think you make more money at Starbucks by the hour than you would as a corporate director. Rusty, you are absolutely right. I, I would tell you for about six months, we met almost every day and sometimes multiple times a day because the issues, the tactics, the strategies that are being used by the activists are frequent and dramatic. And so you have to not only react, you have to anticipate. And so you're right, if you broke it down in an hourly basis uh, based upon the compensation, probably you were doing the job for almost free in a situation like that for the time frame in which you were under attack by an, an, an activist. Uh, you know, also, when you sit on boards, you're presented by the chief executive with really difficult issues, and sometimes they revolve around litigation. Things that the company has done, uh, situations with talent where behavior has not been the right kind of behavior, uh, you have reputational issues that you have to confront that may have an impact on the brand and how uh, the company is valued based upon the perception of the market as to what's going to happen with the company based upon some of the things that it may have done or have admitted and should have done. So these are really, really significant roles that require an individual to be prepared, diligent, and substantially engaged. Rusty, can I add one thing? Please, Art makes a good point. We don't want to get too weedy, but I always, again, for, for a lot of us, and really, I'm honored. I wanted to um, amplify what Art said, how great it is to see all of you here, because you don't know how many times we hear, oh my God, how'd you find Rusty? You know, there's only one. But look, if you, when I asked about your why, you know, a lot of people will come to somebody like Rusty and say, put me on a board. Well, why, know why you want to be on a board. Are you doing it to further your own growth, to deepen your sort of exposure to how other people do things? And if you are privileged to be invited on a board, to Ard's point, you interview them as well. I've turned down some corporate boards because for one thing, you don't want to go on a board that's got a CEO, you know, board, I grew up in the South, so y'all have to forgive me. I tell people, boards ain't that different from black churches. <laughs> you, can, you can walk in a church and either find out, oh, it's lit, 
it's on, the pastor's strong, the pastor's got a strong, or you can walk in and tell, boy, ain't nobody got the keys to the front door, but this old son of a gun sleep in the corner. <laughs> you don't want to go on that board. And you can tell right away whether a CEO has populated a board with a bunch of people that basically are there to get a check and nod their heads, or whether they've got people like Art and me that are going to be independent thinkers. So you have the same right and responsibility to do your research on that company. Make sure they have, you know, the best ethics, great procedures, because trouble comes to everybody. That's one thing I learned as mayor. Um, you're not going to be on a board and not have some ups and downs. What gets you through those is having good people, good ethics, great procedures, great processes. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to interview them as much as they're checking you out. I want to build on that before I go to the next question. When you agree to serve on a board, it's very public. You know, suddenly you are in their proxy statements. Your, you know, information about how much you make on that board is there. Your age, what your professional history has been. So you also have to be ready to be ready for attack if something goes wrong. And if you become associated with a company that goes down the tubes, the next time somebody like me calls to look at you, it's like, ooh, they were on that board for a long time. They didn't do a very good job. We'll move on to somebody else. So that selection is really important. They have to want you, you have to want them, and please don't pay, unless it's a good board, don't just pick the first thing that comes. And maybe it's the right one and you take it, but I've seen people jump and suddenly they call me up two years later, yeah, that was a mistake, I wanna leave. Well, now it looks like why? Because again, this is all public information. It's in databases, it's in the SEC filings. You left after two years, that does not look good. Or even worse, you left after one year, which we had happen to someone recently. So you've really gotta make sure that that is thoughtful. Um, Art. How did you prepare to be on a board? Not the networking, but when you were selected, like, oh my gosh, this is my first board. How do you prepare for that first meeting? It's your first day of school. How do you do it? And Ron, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Well, Rusty, first and foremost, like anything, uh, you have to get steeped in the data. Uh, Rusty mentioned the proxy statement, uh, which tells you a lot about who the board is, the management is, the financials of the company, uh, the direction of the company, uh, some of the investments that it's made, and consuming that information as well as annual reports. Of course, every corporation puts out an annual report. All this is public information that you can find on the website. Also, if you have an opportunity, particularly if you have specific relationships, you want to talk to some of your soon-to-be uh, fellow board members. Uh, to get a sense. And quite candidly, when you're being recruited for a board, you're going to talk to those board members and you're particularly going to talk to the chairman of the board. Because in a lot of ways, these boards, you know, the dirty little secret is these boards are a little bit of inside baseball. Um, you know, the board wants to know that you can play well in the sandbox. Are you someone who is a team player or are you an individual who's looking for fame and glory? Are you someone who's serious about the work that's required or are you just interested in the compensation that comes with a board? Now understand, the compensation piece, I'm gonna get off a little bit, but I wanna make sure everybody understands this. These boards generally play from two to $500,000. Now, 500 is an outlier. Yeah. 250 to 350, I would say, is kind of the bandwidth. So a lot of people are trying to get on corporate boards. Oftentimes, sometimes, I wouldn't say often, but sometimes the compensation is what's, what, what, what's, driving, what's, what's driving them. But if you set the compensation aside, you know, to get prepared, you really have to do your homework, not only about the company, but you need to understand the competitors. You need to understand the broader marketplace, the macro issues that affect the industry and the company in which you're about to join the board so that you can be a valued voice in the decisions that revolve around challenges that the company may have 
as well as opportunities that the company may have with respect to investments and acquisitions and talent acquisition. And so you've got to do a considerable amount of work to get yourself prepared to be a valued partner in the room with your fellow directors. I agree with all of that. Ron, what would you add, and, and how did you prepare to go on your first public or private board? Well, I've been on five public boards, and not ashamed to say, probably went on my first board for all the wrong reasons. But it was all the wrong reasons every white boy had ever been on a board before. So this was after I was elected mayor of Dallas in 95. Um, there was a previous mayor by the name of Jack Evans, an older white guy that had decided he was going to be my mentor. He was dying of cancer. Jack Evans had founded the biggest food retail operation in Texas. His best friend was a guy named Norman Brinker. If any of you all in retail, Norman Brinker started Steak and L and then Chili's. And then their third best friend was Joe Hager. And the only reason I'm telling you this is another lesson. Your first board can be one of somebody in this room that starts a business and goes public or goes private and says, Al, I want you to be on my board. So Jack Evans, Norman Brinker, and Joe Hager all populated one another's boards. Tom, you, you hear what I'm saying? Anyway, Jack Evans was dying of cancer, called me to his, whole, his hospital bedrooms. First time in my life I've ever had that experience of being in a, whole, in a hospital with somebody who was dying and knew it. And he started by saying, I'm dying, I know it, I've had a great life, I love what you're doing, you're making a huge sacrifice for our city, I wanna do something for you. I'm gonna pay for your kids to go to college. He says, I already talked to Norman, and I'm gonna resign in January, you're gonna take my place on the Brinker board. So that's the way it used to happen before Enron. Fortunately, Jack had that conversation with me and walk me through what it would mean, what it would do. Nowadays, in addition to what Art says doing that, it's a lot easier for you. One, if you go on a public board, you're likely to be contacted by somebody like Rusty, one of the people in the executive search business. As much as they're vetting you, they will help you vet that company. But the one thing you all can do, and I know I'm old, is just go on Google. In addition to the company reports, what I find fascinating, always go on their news page because the news will tell you everything. The news will say, we got an activist investor. The news will say somebody else is in. But read enough just that you'll get a sense, is there anything out there? I had a great opportunity. I was determined when I left the U.S. Trade Representatives, I was going on a big international board. I wanted to be an international director. And I finally got my opportunity big company, I shouldn't name it, but a huge opportunity, foreign owned and that, and I was just about to say yes, and then I did enough work, I thought, I'm a lawyer, let me call some of my law partners. And they said, well, you do know in this country, there is no such thing as D&O insurance, and the directors are individually liable. And then as I started doing my What's in the News, I found five articles that the founder of the company, who was brilliant, had hired and fired four CEOs in the last 36 months. So that wasn't just a flashing red light. You know, that was somebody rolling a grenade in the room and said, boy, run. So, <laughs> but it, it, the good thing is I'm saying there are so many avenues for you to do your homework just to get a sense of the country the company even beyond what you can read in the 10K and the annual reports, and then talk to people. And one thing, and, and I'll stop, every board I've gone on since then, I always insist on my own one-on-one -on -one with the CEO and the executive team. Because I want to know what, what are you looking for? What are your expectations for me? How do you define a good director? Because as Art says, you don't want to be there with just a bunch of yes people nodding your head, letting the CEO do whatever he wants. Because when you do get that activist investor, I mean, these things can become tedious. There can be liability involved. So just do your, do your homework and pick the right opportunity. And the only other thing I'll say, don't get caught in this trap of saying, I only want to be on a Fortune 500 company board. You want to get on a board. Because let me tell you, once you've been on a board, you are credentialed as a corporate director. 
And your best advocates are often those seven, eight other corporate directors who sit around the table with you and are then going to say, Art Collins is incredible. You ought to talk to him. I, I really want to emphasize that point. Don't get hooked up on size. I had a, someone who's a friend, who's a brother. I called him up. I said, I've got a great board opportunity for you. It's X, Y, and Z. And he said, Rusty, I will only look at companies whose market cap is over $30 billion. Now, let me tell you what I do. I focus on the Fortune 500. My firm will do, in the Americas alone, 500 board searches a year. I co-head the practice, so I see all the data. And all I could think to this fool on the other side of the phone, ain't none of them looking at you. <laughs> you better be glad I'm calling you about this when your name never comes up. Be realistic. I have a brother. I, I, it's it's going to be good news, and hopefully it will happen soon. We chatted, and he, he, I said, what boards do you want to be on? He said, well, I'd really like to be on Microsoft, Apple, or Alphabet. And my response to him, you will be on one of those, because he's that good. And he will be on one of those, and it will be announced this month. So, you know, he knew where to aim, and he aimed exactly right. I have other folks who say, I want to be on PE boards, because we create value. We're different. We are about giving advice. It's a very different thing. It's privately held, and then it's going to go public, and they want to learn that. So really make sure you're aiming in the right place where you can add value, because to Ron's point, if you don't add value on a board, when I call up Art and go, well, how was Butch on that board? Mm, I don't know, fair to Midland. You're dead. You want the soft references to be really good. Art, you know, Ron told a story about a mistake that he almost made. Any story like that for you, or one you actually did make, and how did you get out of it related to a board? For-profit or non-profit? Yeah, I would, I would tell you um, this is uh, my greatest mistake, and I think about it regularly. I was much, much younger. Uh, I heard Joe Briggs call out our alma mater, Florida a and so I spent about 20 years of my life in this state. And uh, when I was 41, I became chairman of the board at the university. And I had not really had any substantial government experience. I had been on some nonprofit local boards in the community, but nothing that had, well, maybe one other board that had a statewide impact, nothing with a national impact. So I was still learning what governance meant. And we uh, lost our CEO, our president of the university, and we went through a search. And I was so determined to make sure that the outcome of that search was what I wanted it to be, because I thought I knew best uh, for our institution, particularly having been a student at that institution, that I became more of an activist in the search process as opposed to being the chairman of the board and more of a manager of the search process. And I showed my hand in ways where I went and did interviews of specific candidates that I wanted to, 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 to rise to the top. And sometimes you have adversaries on boards. Sometimes they have agendas that are different than yours. And to the extent that others are not being transparent, your transparency can work against you. And so I stepped too far out front in that decision and ultimately, at the last minute, the candidate that was best for the institution withdrew from the process. And I take some responsibility for that, given my activism. So that goes back to earlier what I talked about in terms of being a team player and being able to understand that on these boards, although they're public companies or whether they're private companies, you're still dealing with individuals. And there's politics. And there's negotiations and there's trade-offs, and it can't be about you. It has to be about the institution. It can't be about your ego. It has to be about the mission and making sure that the individual that's selected is best to achieve that mission. So that was my greatest mistake as a director, if you will, on a board. And I want to emphasize, listen to that. One of the things that when you're interviewed for a board by any search firm, 
once we call you, we assume you've got the right educational background, the right professional experience. It's really about what you've done the last 10 years. If you want to know what we care about, it's your last 10, 10 years as an executive and your track record. But what we're really interviewing you for, board behaviors. Are you going to be a team player? Are you going to listen? Do you have humility? I mean, we actually have sheets and we capture these things down and we write them up about each candidate. You know, can you go into a, different, a difficult situation? One of Ron's greatest gifts, he can go into a difficult situation, listen, and if there's a lot of tension, he has an amazing ability to use humor to take the tension down and to solve the problem. It's those leadership behaviors that really matter in the board interview with both the recruiting firm and with the directors. There may be some, oh, this one has international experience, that one's got technology experience. You can't control that. You can't control your behaviors and how you show up. That really matters. And if I, if, if I can, Rusty, just a little bit more on this, because I, I, I'm looking at the time. No, because I'm going to sure. love on you. I'm going to just say, I've known, we've all been friends, you can tell. As much as I have admired Art Walker, I don't know if there was anything he could have said that would have taken him to the next level than his humility and honesty in what he just said. Yep. That's leadership. To be that introspective when you're in that, I'm just saying, it's Art, true. that's a deal. I had a more recent experience. I'm not sure how much I can go, but let, let me say two things. Um, all of you in this room, I'm going to believe, are here because you have some level of ambition, not only ambition, but you've got the talent and the skill set. And one, I just don't want it to go unspoken. Ground zero is you got to own what you do and be really, really good at what you do. Secondly, we don't often think of service on a not-for-profit board like a college as a stepping stone to a for-profit board. Nothing could be further than the truth, particularly college boards of trustees. Remember, everybody else on there is somebody, and they often are the first call that somebody's going to make. Because every board I'm on, even if we use a search firm, and, and Rusty says, here are the five candidates, the first thing we do as a board is say, who knows them? Oh, I'll yep. call Art Walker. You don't think about those not-for-profit boards. And I got into a little bit of, of the, the, the Terrell Owens trap. I will tell you, I was proud of my time as mayor. I think most people in Dallas will tell you I was a pretty good mayor. My, I would tell you that I was incredible. But I was feeling myself. <laughs> you know, I was, I was having that, you know, what Terrell Owens said, I love me some me. So I was being invited to be on all these boards. And I got into this trap where people would say, well, Butch, we don't need, you don't have to come. We just got to have your name because we always have somebody from Black Enterprise, from the Collins Group on the um, Congressional Black Caucus thing. So I looked up and my wife and I were on every not-for-profit board in Dallas. And these people will tell you, we just have to have the mayor. You don't have to come. What you don't calculate Five years from now, when you are being vetted for that board and somebody picks up the phone and says, hey, Art, didn't you serve on the CBC Foundation with Ron Kirk? How was he? And Art's going to say, we never saw that Negro. He didn't, come to, he didn't come to a single meeting. And that can come back to haunt you. So one, use the not-for-profit world, but don't get yourself stretched so thin. Treat those not-for-profits just like you would a corporate board. And if you really don't have the time to go, because folks, your most precious commodity is your time. You can't be running your own business and being on five different boards and two corporate boards. You gotta show up. So I'm just saying value your time and make sure that if you commit yourself, you really commit yourself and you've got the time to serve. The other thing is ask questions. I recently went on I shouldn't say this, but since we're through a lawsuit out there, because this is recent. I recently went on the board of Boy Scouts of America seven years ago, and I was asked to do it by a couple of really good friends of mine, Bob Gates, Randall Stevenson. I did it because my father was the, the first black scout leader in Austin. I was a Boy Scout. I thought, Boy Scouts, what could go wrong? <laughs> 
So I didn't do the diligence with the Boy Scouts that I might have in 20, you know, four months into my tenure. Five years later, we're coming that, out of the largest. That's a great example. So because even for something you care about, take the time, do your diligence. Doing due diligence is really important, but we want to pivot now to Q&A. So what questions do you have for us? I think there are people around the room with mics, so we don't want to keep talking. We want to make this interesting. Over here. Hi, good morning, uh, and thank you for doing this. So uh, from a diversity perspective uh, and various boards, there have been a ton of initiatives that you've seen, particularly for more women and certainly for, uh, for people of color to be on these boards. When you're on the boards and you're, th those conversations have, have happened, what's the current environment like from your perspective uh, and as a search firm, would you I'll say that? I'll take that one. Yeah, I'm going to take that one. Oh, one thing. You did this beautifully, so this is a compliment. He asked the question really quickly because we want to watch the time, so thank you. Um, here's the answer. It's a great time to be a person of color, to be on a board. Last year, Russell Reynolds, 33% of our placements in the U.S., which is about 500 people, so that's a big number, a third of them were people of color. Half were women. Half of all of our board placements in the, in the U.S. That's a big deal because that was not true 10 years ago. Even we track our own data, 10 years ago, you're looking at more like 15%, maybe 25% women. So it has really improved, and companies used to be one token. Now it's multiple and multiple ethnicities. You were next, then you. Hi, um, just a quick question. Thank you very much for conducting this interview. What is something that you've learned about yourself along your journey, walking in your purpose of becoming a board member that you didn't believe you could become, that you could emulate, that you could represent, that you could uphold, that you do right now, that has probably helped you to become board members? Art and Ron. That's a great question. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago in the hood. So everything I do <laughs> is, uh, not something I really expected to happen in, in, in my life. And the way that translates in the boardroom is when you go through adversity um, and you have to make something out of nothing, uh, you learn a lot about yourself. And you can take that skill set into any setting, including the boardroom because oftentimes the challenges of companies require you to be creative uh, and to think out of the box along with your executive management team. And so, you know, I, I think life in and of itself is preparation for the boardroom. Rod. The only thing I would say, and I heard a young brother say this when we were here at ELC, all of us have to guard against letting the voice in our head be the one that tells you, you can't do something. And more than anything else, once I've gotten in that room, and I've been in the room with some incredibly impressive people, as you realize, your input is as valuable as theirs. They just have a different experience. And I have to go back to the brother that asked about DE and I. Uh, one of my mentors is a great friend, Milton Carroll, who's been on a number of corporate boards, chairman of boards, and Milton Carroll just makes it plain. I'm on the board to help black people. Period. And at first I got worried that I was always on Nam and Gov, but that's where the power is. And I told that story about me being on the first board and I'll stop, about Norm Brinker and Jack. No other group of people worries as much as we do about, should I say something? Mm -hmm. You know, they know we're black. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, I mean, we, we can hide a lot of other stuff, but, but don't, if you don't promote us, nobody no, else no. will. And one of the things I'm most proud of. Amen. Over here. Hi, my name is Ernest Brown with uh, Dell Technologies, and um, I also serve on the American Marketing Association uh, board in Sacramento, where I live as vice president of DEI. I've started to uh, prepare myself for paid board service. Um, uh, took, participated in Take Your Seat earlier this year. Okay. And 
my career path so far has been individual contributor. And I won't, so I haven't been in management. So for people whose careers take that trajectory, is there any advice that you could give those should my career not span into management? A a absolutely. Um, because my career was never in management. I, I, I spent time with IBM out of school uh, with a business degree in accounting and finance, but I never had a division or a company that I ran where I had a profit and loss responsibility, uh, except for the company that I own today. Mm -hmm. So one of the greatest, I think, preparations and positioning for being on a corporate board, and we've been talking about it already, is nonprofit boards. Mm -hmm. Because governance is governance. And if you're on a large enough nonprofit board, national boards, global boards that are focused on issues, uh, they have a profit and loss statement, although it's not so much a profit and loss statement, but they have to bring in income and they have expenditures and, and it has to be managed well. They have talent acquisition, including CEOs and other C-suite executives. Uh, they make decisions about how they want to penetrate their brand into various markets, depending on what they're doing. So nonprofit organizations are a lot like corporate organizations, they're just not for profit. Let me just add hospital boards. Hospitals are companies. You've got people in beds, you've got ambulatory services, you have all of the stuff, you have complex staff, heavy regulation, and guess what? Rich people love to be on the hospital board, so when they get sick, they get good care. And I know several people who somebody from that board said, she did a great job, she is really good, and now she is on a Fortune 500 board. And it was, I can name a couple of people like that because the experience they had, they served on the audit committee, which can be painful, but is the best single learning experience anyone could have as a director. I'll give you one more piece, if I can, quickly. And then we're gonna go there. So, um, in my late 20s, here in Florida, I was an insurance regulator. I ran a division that took over troubled insurance companies. That responsibility and experience served me well when I was being interviewed by Aflac to join their board because they understood that I understood insurance regulation. And they're regulated in every 50 state, all of the 50 states. And so government service is another place you can pick up a skill set, as Ron did, as the chief executive officer of a city with a budget that had to be managed and balanced. And as a United States trade representative, that government service, the diplomacy that he learned, the negotiating skills, all of that comes to play in the boardroom. So there are multiple ways to position yourself for getting on the board beyond being a manager or a CEO of a company. Thank you. John Shumay, currently serve on the nonprofit board, my alma mater. Now that you're on the nonprofit side, how do you transition, and specifically for you, Jack, how do you get on the radar and how do you get someone to pick up the phone to call you? Well, the, what you want to do when you're on a nonprofit board is first of all, do a great job. The second thing is half of board searches, particularly with smaller companies, so where you all will start, there's no search firm involved. Nobody, no small company wants to pay a firm like mine six figures to find somebody. It's like, I can find somebody. Um, they call us when they can't. So do a good job and then network. And Ron, I'd like for you to take this one. In your communities, network with business leaders. Actually make a list. Who do I know that sits on a public company board? And I'm gonna quote Melody Hobson here, and we all revere Melody Hobson. Please do not call someone up and go, I wanna be on your board, because forever, she says, every time I look at you, I'm gonna say, oh God, he wants to be on my board. That is not what you want. And this is for JP Morgan, Starbucks. These are not small companies, and these are big CEOs who are asking her this, so everybody does it. But you know, get to know them and ask them you know, any advice you have. People love to give advice. The older we are, the more, love, the more we love to give advice, don't we? Um, here we are up on the stage, just for Butch. Um, it, that's what the thing you do to get on the radar, and then you speak, you write, you go to conferences, and things like that. Do not cold call recruiters. Ron's wife and I were partners together in a recruiting firm. We literally get half a dozen emails a day from people we don't know, and it just hits delete. Um, because we, we could not do it. A warm introduction 
from someone, if Ron says, I need you to talk to somebody, I talk to them. If Art says, I need you to talk to somebody, or I want you to talk to somebody, Butch too, I do it. That's how you do it, that warm introduction. But Ron, what advice do you have from the One thing I would say, just again, I go back to that, how they do it, network, network. You know, we so often think, oh, I gotta get to know Ron Kirk or Art Con. Your colleagues, your classmates, your friends, can be every much of an on-ramp to an opportunity. So really use the power of this gathering to know one another, think about your classmates, where they are, uh, and just keep plugging, it'll, it'll come. And the only thing I'd say is, Rusty made the point about the guy saying, I only wanna be on a Fortune 500. I mean, I have preached forever. Private equity firms buy companies, do stuff, put on those boards who they want. And those are great opportunities with a much bigger financial upside, frankly, if they go public, not saying that's your primary goal. So be open to anything, just keep working. Yeah. Right, if, if I may, I, I want Rusty to respond to this, I'm gonna flip the script a little bit. There, there's also a season in your life for public company boards. That's true. Right? Most public company boards, they're not looking for 30-somethings. They generally aren't. Because the presumption is that you haven't done enough kind of in your life to be in a position to have the governance responsibility. Now, I know people in the old days who were in their 30s, but nowadays, I think it's a little bit different. And Rusty, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, so the, most of the people we put on boards are in their 50s and 60s. People who are in marketing and technology, we skew younger. So like the youngest person, I personally, and I will say I, Russell Reynolds, we work in teams, but where I led the work, um, it was a 38-year-old, and of course he was a tech whiz and you know, was chief marketing officer of digital marketing. So those people tend to skew younger. Um, but what, what boards want is someone who's had enough time in career to be well-rounded. Remember I used the phrase good judgment? They want good judgment. They want you to have seen things. Now, what you should do in your 30s and 40s are join significant nonprofit boards and don't fill your resume up with lots of poop-up nonprofit boards, like ones that matter to you first, because you've got passion and you care, and then two, that have some significance, that have some people on it where you can learn from them, learning mentality, and they can learn from you, because you've got to bring something too, and then just keep growing and elevating those, and then it's just a glide path into it. Thank you, and don't delete my LinkedIn message. <laughs> <laughs> got it. Hi there. Good morning. Ron Ski, Vice President with 110. So we're a nonprofit started after George Floyd by leaders like Ken Frazier and Ken Chenault. So this one is about your insight from the board perspective. Post SCOTUS, three years after George Floyd, diversity has become a dirty word. What are you seeing from your level that we can take back and help make sure that we don't lose the ground that we've gained with this post affirmative action post SCOTUS decision that's attacking us. Right. Well, I'm, I'm wearing this LDF button intentionally. I'm on the board of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. But separately, you're giving me a chance, and I don't know this, Ron, you're giving me a chance to brag on my law firm, one of the things I'm most proud of. We're representing the Fearless Fund, those two sisters who've been sued. We're representing them for free. So, pro bono. So we believe in it. You've got to look at your company, but, but you know, one of our battles over the last 10 years has been to stop having the conversation of DNI as a quarterly thought piece. It is a part of your business model. And if you can make that case, then you keep doing it until somebody tells you to stop. But not naive, this Ed Bloom guy is going after everybody. But as our former president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, Sherilyn Eiffel said, you know, you just think of everything John Lewis, Dr. King did when all they had was a hope and a prayer. We bring a little bit more to the table than that. So we can think our way through this. We have time for one last question. It's gotta be fast. All right, good morning. Brian D. Scott with Dell Technologies. Appreciate your time and your information. Uh, I'm actually the chair on a board for my high school to uh, promote more diversity. But uh, one question I have that's a little different than that. Uh, because of the fact that I work for Dell Technologies, if I were looking for an opportunity to be on a board, say for one of our partners, not, not competitor of course, but partner, 
Is there a way to leverage that so that there's not a conflict of interest? I will, we are now out of time. The answer is yes, you should do it. And companies have internal boards, partner boards, JV boards, absolutely do it. With that, we are out of time. And thank you all so much for attending. And thank you, thank you. to these two. We greatly appreciate it. We got a few more things to talk to you about before you head out, if you don't mind, give us your attention. Can we give another round of applause to our amazing, amazing panel, Ron and Art and Harold? Rusty, weren't they amazing? Amazing indeed. I know some of you are ready to get out of here, itching to get out of here. Just a few more things. Please allow me to share a few housekeeping notes before you make it to your next session. So one, the gentleman, maybe lady too, most active on social media, using the following hashtag, the tic toe symbol, for those a bit older, BMXL, has a chance to win a gift certificate. Listen carefully. Two days and one night stay for two with a golf view room. I don't hear any ooh. Here at the JW Marriott Turnberry Resort and Spa, and accommodations include room, tax and resort fee, and a round of golf for two. Can I hear another ooh? It does not include caddy or caddy gratuity. This certificate is valid for one year, October 16th, 2023, to October 16th, 2024. So all of you avid golfers, let me hear, woo woo. All right, a few, you can still come. Both financial and executive coaching begin at 11 a.m. and you will find financial coaching hosted by Fidelity Investments in Majestic 7. And executive leadership one-on-one -on -one coaching hosted by J.P. Morgan Chase can be found in Majestic 8. Few more.